Hey, welcome to Wine Talks with Paul K. And we are in studio today in beautiful Southern California, about to have a conversation with Brooke Martin all the way out in Salt Lake City. Introductions in just a moment. Wine Talks, of course, available on iHeartRadio, Pandora, wherever you hang out for your podcasting is sponsored by the original Wine of the Month Club. Listen up for a show that just came out on Monique Sultani, a very interesting story about a passionate woman who's persevered some amazing uh, difficulties in her life to become uh, a rather well-known wine influencer in, in, in personality. That's coming out today, actually, so have a listen. But not why we're here today. We're here to talk about Brooke Martin, who is in Salt Lake City. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Happy to be here. So nice to have you on the show. And, and she is a wine influencer, which I which I was listening to a podcast that you were on where you said, I don't like that term, wine wine, <laughs> wine influencer. But I, I think it's more of like a designation of like sort of the social, you know, it's, it's, it's a social term. Isn't it just a term like that we would use for people that are on the on the social networks and who talk about a particular subject? Yeah, absolutely. It's, you know, it just for a lot of people or some people it has a, a negative connotation to it, but um, that's pretty much what I do. A lot of content creation, uh, influence others, what wines um, to maybe try. So I guess it's fitting. It's because I just had a show with a guy in England and his name was Liam Darcy and, mm -hmm. and he calls himself the wine Wally. And so my first question was like, what, what is a wine wall? He goes, a wine idiot. So <laughs> I guess it's some kind of English sort of term for like, you know, sort of an imbecile, but th that's why he calls himself that. Cause he's trying to attract the, the wine novice into tasting wines the way he does, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, so there's, mm -hmm. it could be an influencer. It could be a wall. It could be whatever you want it to be. Right. So <laughs> it doesn't matter. Absolutely. Can I ask you this question? Could you pick a more difficult place in the world or the United States to be in the wine sector? You know, it's funny. I get asked that all the time. They're like, wait, you live in Utah and you work in the wine industry. So, you know, I kind of just fell into it. <laughs> um, not accidentally. I, I, um, it was intended, but it started just as kind of a, a passion um, I needed something fun to do because at the time I had a pretty stressful corporate job and I needed an outlet and that's mm -hmm. um, kind of how it started and then it grew into what it is today and almost two years ago I quit that corporate job and now I'm just wow. working in wine full time. Congratulations right. that's uh, you know that's a dream and that's hard to do and it yep. takes a lot of guts and courage to do something like yep. that. And like I said, particularly in Utah. Though I will say, um, I'm very familiar with the Utah world, the, the DABC, and you know, have worked with them in the past and other, other things. And when I was there, you were in California, right? You were in Napa. Yep. When I was coming out to Salt Lake City, what yeah, were you doing? We in tried Napa to then? connect then. Yeah. What, what um, were you doing? Well, you know, I do travel quite a bit now to California for work, for different projects, uh, different events that are going on. But uh, that particular trip was with some friends. So we've been doing an annual trip uh, once a year with our friends. That's and great. that's it fell on those days that you were here and I was there. So, well, so, so while you were there and you were experiencing the beautiful wine country in California, I got to visit. I was in Salt Lake City. I had an hour to kill before I had to get to the airport. So I just went to the wine shop in downtown Salt Lake, or not downtown necessarily, but I, I was flabbergasted by the selection, the number of SKUs it had, the size of the sh store is huge. And I'm like, mm -hmm. that isn't the impression that I would have drawn uh, from any other part of the country if I heard about Utah's strict alcohol laws. I mean, that's amazing to me. So there must be some culture of wine in, in Utah. There is. There absolutely is. Um, there's a misconception that nobody drinks in Utah. Um, there's a lot of drinkers. There's a lot of people that Ooh, love wine. And, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but not only that, we love good wine. And we have a lot of people here that like boutique wines. So mm -hmm. um, I hear that a lot when people come to Utah and they go to our state-run liquor stores. The one you probably went to was the largest um, wine store downtown, mm -hmm. which has just a phenomenal selection. 
And, um, but that's what people say to me all the time that have experienced some of the liquor stores that we have. They had no idea of the selection of wines, um, the quality of wines mm -hmm. that we have in our liquor stores. My research has uh, put me through to a lot of different parts of this uh, industry. And uh, the only state in the country that's ever thrown anybody in jail for shipping alcohol into Utah was Utah. Um, and <laughs> so it still should be, they went into their state and that was in the nineties and it was a beer guy and it was a rather funny comical story, but, uh, you know, they're very strict about it, but that's why, when I saw that story, I thought, wow, this is amazing. They had everything from like 19 crimes up to Opus and, and even uh -huh. some classified growth Bordeaux. So I was fascinated by that because it wasn't that long ago when you had to go to the store and buy a little 50 ml airplane bottle of alcohol and take it to the restaurant to buy a $3 glass of cranberry juice. That's no longer the case, right? No. So they, they did away with that whole thing where like you had to be a, a member of mm -hmm. a, a restaurant mm -hmm, or right. whatever <laughs> to be able to drink. It was, yeah, pretty ridiculous. Um, we, we really have to thank Mitt Romney uh, back when the Olympics were here, helping out kind of loosen some of the liquor laws. That's when it first kind of uh, some of those rules and regulations went away. Um, they kind of tightened it up again afterwards, but then again, they've kind of I don't want to say loosen things up because it is still everything state run. Even though I have my wine brokerage license for the state of Utah, I mm -hmm. still have to, I might get myself in trouble here, but I still have to drive to Wyoming to pick up all my wine shipments with different brands that I work with because I can't ship it into the state of Utah. Well, based on my conversations with um, some of the DABC people, um, you're, not alone so i don't think it's a problem yeah. <laughs> well but, what's what's frustrating is they know they know that we all do that and we actually our legislatures did pass a law to allow wineries to ship into utah and still have to go through the state to mm -hmm. be taxed and all of that and the dabs is saying oh yeah sorry we can't do that we don't have the infrastructure mm, the yeah. employees and blah 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 and it's like well i can't so imagine. i don't know when things are going to change i can't imagine with you know because the laws that we deal with shipping to 50 different states well 42 different states from here using a variety of licenses to do it I and mean, my opinion is um prohibition which was wait a minute today is repeal day no yeah no yesterday yesterday, yesterday, yesterday. Was repeal day. Yep. Uh, it, re and it really wasn't repealed. It was just sent down to the states. And there's now instead of one uh, prohibition, there's 50. And each one has its own you know, nuances. But and so that's my political opinion on this. But um, I can't imagine what it would take. And I don't know how many stores they have. But wow, what a logistic nightmare to to even handle just Barton's vodka, you know, to all the state stores there must be to sell to. So I, I don't yeah. know, it'd be quite a task. Um, yeah. We'll, we'll get off of that sore subject here in a second. What? <laughs> <laughs> what? Um, you, 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 I wrote, you wrote in some of your things that you try to make wine approachable for people. And as an influencer, or somebody that people look up to or want to study or at least get your opinion on wine, what, what does that mean to you when you say you want to make wine approachable? I don't want it to be intimidating. I think for a lot of people that don't know. Uh, a lot about wine. Um, they just, they want to drink what tastes good to them. And that's going to be different for every person. So when I want to make it approachable, I want to uh, talk about wine in a genuine down to earth way. Mm. Um, and I feel like I've done that with my audience and that's what they appreciate about me that, um, I, I'm not pretentious when it comes to wine. I don't try to act like I'm a know-it-all. Um, it's, it's something that we should all be able to enjoy and not be judged for what mm -hmm. we drink, what we don't drink. Um, if your palate likes it, drink it. Hey, that's right. If it's for, well, but it, plus it's got to be 14% alcohol or else why bother? No, I'm kidding. So <laughs> Hey, if you want to have a nice buzz going on, yes. Yeah, I thought I just thought it was an interesting word because it is an important word. And wine 
uh, certainly is intimidating if you from the outside in, right? If you're looking at it. Mm -hmm. But I think once you get into the bowels of it, you realize that no one knows everything and it's very difficult to know everything and it changes yeah. uh, rapidly. Uh, I've had a guy on a show named Emmanuel Kamiji as a master psalm, but he got it in 1996. And he'll tell mm -hmm. you that in 1996, you know, we had to study Burgundy, Bordeaux and parts of Spain and that was pretty much it. You, there was no Argentina uh -huh. or there was no Chilean you know, value to, to study. Yeah. And so he's already obsolete in his studies. And so I thought, I thought that that's fascinating. So we, you and I know it's it's a complicated subject, but making it approachable, which is an interesting word. That's why I brought it up. Like, how would you explain to somebody that this wine is approachable? Like that, I use that word all the time. Oh, it's very approachable. And they look at me cross-eyed, like, what, you know, what are you talking about? What does that mean, approachable? And I, I go, I don't know, that's a pretty tough question. <laughs> but yeah, you taste the wine enough, you feel like you understand what that means, but to the novice... Are we trying to explain some of these terms when you're doing this, uh, your blogging and and and, uh, and writing? Yeah, and you know, I use those terms as well. But sometimes I have to keep in mind that it may mean something differently to mm -hmm. different people. So um, again, I try to keep things pretty basic. Um, so that people don't feel that intimidation mm -hmm. or like, oh, well, she knows what she's talking about. I don't want to, you know, get in a, to a discussion with her. So, um, <laughs> but uh, with oh, wine, cool. as you, as you know, it's more about experience anyways. Um, that, and I, I feel like I kind of did things backwards. So I got into wine and really started enjoying it and, I have a, I would like to say I have a pretty decent palette. Um, so once I, my blog and everything kind of started growing, I'm like, well, shit, now I need to, I actually need to get some education to back this up. Mm -hmm. So it's not just experience because as you know, in the wine industry, um, that's just not enough. Right. Um, so you, you do, you do have to have the credentials or some credentials, um, depending on what you want to do, of course. And what did you decide to do then? Uh, well, I... Master Court of Sommeliers, or you go to get a Master of Wine, which I have a funny story for that, or did you just start with the WSET program? Or? So I, I'm, the WSET program is what I started with. I, I didn't feel like I needed to do level one. I thought that was pretty basic. So I jumped to level two, passed that you know, with distinction, level three, um, I did that just over a year ago, about a year and a half ago. Obviously, that one's a big step from level two, um, past that. And I have thought about doing the diploma for, through the WSEP, but I don't know uh, with what I'm doing with, um, my business and personally if i really need to go that yeah. direction the time you mean yeah. the time because it is a time sucker is it, um, is it like uh you know master of wines five years probably minimum just to, just to think you're going to take the test uh, a master psalm is not on not far from behind that is yeah. that what it take to get the diploma from the wset program well, once you get like the through the diploma program, which they like you to try to complete it within two years, but mm -hmm. you really can get it done in three years if you're, you know, need more time. Uh, the next step from there is to go through the like a master sommelier program. And there's levels to that, too. I think a lot of people don't realize that you don't just jump into the master sommelier program. Um, no, no, you don't. It's a very yeah. complicated and a very long term. And it's, yeah. uh, we must as well just peel that back now. It, you know, when I started this business in the eighties, these things were around, they weren't very popular. They weren't important, but there were also six digit SOM jobs in Vegas and other places that were paying very well to have, mm -hmm. to have those degrees. And those, those jobs don't really exist anymore. And they have, they've been redefined completely. So sure. you're doing everything, you know, you know, you're walking the floor and you're doing the wine buying and you're running yeah. on the side or whatever, but um, it's a credential, right? I mean, 
in, in, in Los Angeles, if you don't have some W set level, whether it's one, two or three, you can't even get a job selling wine. And it seems to me that's more of a practical issue than it is really the passion of the subject issue. In other words, mm -hmm. if you're passionate about the subject, well, I said, here's an example. I sat at a very high end port tasting a few weeks ago. I mean, this off the charts level of ports and the guy next to me was, I mean, he knew much more about wine than I did. And I've been tasting for 32 years. I've tasted a hundred thousand wine, but he's so passionate about the subject that he was able to talk about, I mean, amazing stuff. Mm -hmm. he, has no he has no credential. Yeah. Right. It's about the yeah. passion. And you have the it passion. Is. Definitely. I, I did. What started happening for me is I started having a lot more business coming through brands wanting to work with me, but I was also having brands ask what my credentials were. So um, mm -hmm. I could tell that, and I have had some brands that have told me they don't even work with wine influencers unless they have at least a W set three. So I think it was a positive thing for me to for do sure. that. And I, I did learn a lot and I got a lot out of it, but um, with wine, as you mentioned, you'll never stop learning about wine. You'll never know everything about wine. It is one of those topics that you have to continue to not only experience and taste, but I think it is beneficial to continue the education, even if it's just on your own. So mm -hmm. that's what I do now. Mm -hmm. I take these one-off courses or um, just reading uh, just to stay in the know with what's going on in the wine industry. It's kind of interesting you said what you said, because I wasn't diluting uh, the value of the, the, the credential. I, yeah, no. Since you were um approached by brands to, that and it makes sense but if you put w set next to your name on a instagram post i don't know 99.9 of the people that are following you aren't going to know what that means and so no, exactly and to the credential to the potential brand it shouldn't mean anything because you, what you should what should mean to them is that your influencer value mm -hmm. which is your followers and your you know your your um well i have to tell you something i feel pretty proud of this uh, this tasting I was telling you about, I posted on TikTok and on Instagram, the simplest video you've ever seen. It's uh -huh. just my friend, Don Schliff, who's used to run a very large wine house here, a wine company, opening a bottle of port with his hot tongs, not tongue, <laughs> tongs. He's got this device. He gets the thing red hot. He clamps it on the neck of the bottle. Port's very old. You don't use a corkscrew. It snaps the bottle off from the heat. That's all yeah. it is. Yeah. 4.5 million views on TikTok, 1 million views on Instagram. Oh, wow. Yeah. Can you that? Yeah. You no just music. never know. <laughs> you just never know what's going to take off and <laughs> get That's good engagement. <laughs> That's of course, awesome. I'm not, yeah. I'm not in the video, so that doesn't mean no good at all. But <laughs> 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 so, you know, it's, this is interesting because not only are you in Utah and you, the, you bit this off as a hobby and now it's become a passion and a job. There's a huge, a huge awareness of women in wine right now, not only women in wine, yeah. but minorities, people of color, all the spectrum. Is that been beneficial to you or has it been headwinds to you to be a woman trying to do this? Um, I wish it wasn't such a big deal. I wish it was I agree. like, you know, I, I mean, come on, it, what, what is it? We're 2022. I, I don't think it should be <laughs> such a big issue that women are, you know, making such a splash in the wine industry, but yeah, I'm proud of that. And I want to be a part of that movement. Um, sometimes though, I, I don't want to like tout, tout that as the main thing, mm -hmm because it shouldn't be that big of a deal nowadays. People should just be used to it. Um, but I am happy that the wine industry is um, recognizing women more mm -hmm. and having and being more approachable. There's that word again. There you go. Hey. <laughs> in, in the industry. Well, you know, your palates are better than ours anyway. I mean, it's- I, I, Yeah, I they are. <laughs> It is a fact. My yeah. husband tells me that every day. <laughs> yes. 
I, I cannot stump my wife, so she's not um, necessarily a wine enthusiast. She obviously lo- enjoys wine, but I cannot serve her Syrah in any fi- any form. So she doesn't yeah. even know how good her palate is because I could bring her a Cote de Rhone, I could bring her a, a Central Coast Syrah or something from another part of the world, and she turns it away. I mean, yeah. maybe I've stumped her one out of 20 times. So yeah. <laughs> she doesn't know how refined her palate is that she's able yeah. to, to, be, to pick that out. I think it's an important subject. I think it's interesting um, that there's awareness of it. I just not sure I believe or feel that there was headwinds deliberately placed and that there was actually some kind of sexism to, to getting into the industry. And I, same with minorities. I, I sense and I've seen and I've heard and I've, witnessed possibly um headwinds that could come from that but part of it i think comes from this industry that just is like you're saying it's intimidating from the outside in if you're not into it and i had this conversation yesterday with the young woman in in vermont very bright uh young lady who's forming a co-op winery i go what do you think was happening in 1975 or 72 when louis martini and robert mondavi and Timothy Christian, you know, Christian, uh, brother Timothy from the Christian brothers were with the Napa Valley Vintners. So they would have looked like a bunch of old white guys, right? Mm-hmm. But none of them were, right? They're immigrants. They'd come from uh, Italy. They they were forging their own way. Mike Gergich from Croatia, you know, lands in St. Helena with $32 in his shoe. I mean, they're white, but they're not, I mean, they're just on a shoestring themselves trying to make trying to make life happen. So I, I, I think I agree with you. I, I think it's time to like, it shouldn't be a subject necessarily, but yeah, glad, I, glad the awareness has happened. Yeah. I, and I'm very happy that the industry is more accepting and I guess recognizing uh, women in the wine industry. I think it's just natural as time has gone on uh, that there's more women in the industry, more women winemakers. Uh, that's just kind of what happens over yeah. 30 years, right? <laughs> I had a young girl intern. I had a young girl intern. She sat and she did a great job for me. And she can't wait to get to like UC Davis, start an mm-hmm. school, become, you know, become a wine person. Yeah. Uh, you, we were talking earlier about a trip to uh, Paso Robles that you made during during COVID. How was that? Yeah. That was such an amazing trip. And mm-hmm. I think part of it was because I was just so ready to get out of my house. <laughs> and um, I, I, I made it a road trip. Uh, normally, I will fly to... California when I visit wine country, but I'm like, let's just drive. Let's start in Paso Robles. Paso Robles. I can't even talk and I haven't Easy even been drinking. <laughs> <laughs> Paso Robles. And then go, we went down like to the Santa Barbara area after that. Oh, so, you do? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. You go to Santa Barbara was, proper to downtown? San Inez. Um, but yeah. yeah, went through Santa Barbara. Yeah. Wow. So Paso, how did you find it? Like, you know, rural, uh, Napa, Napa-ish, Sonoma-ish, um, like, was it congenial? Of course, this was COVID, so maybe it was a little bit different. Well, actually, we were there during COVID. Um, did, did, did you find the people, the food? What, what did you find? Uh, I actually enjoyed all of it. So we, I, the reason I started or why that happened in the first place um visiting that area was because a brand a winery had reached out asking if i'd come visit the area um and because it was on my list i was like yes absolutely i will come (laughs) to your winery um and i found the wines to be much better than i thought they were going to be from Mm -hmm. that area and that's just me not knowing enough about right. Paso because um, there are some phenomenal wines coming out of that area. So I was pleasantly surprised at um, the wines that I tried. The people were great. Um, 
the little coffee shops that mm -hmm. were right there in town, everything was just very nice. I, I would love to go back because that was the only, the first and only time I've been to the area. How long is that drive? It must've been uh, a little lengthy. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, <laughs> well, we stopped, where did we stop? We stopped in Vegas. Oh, did well, okay. That's the change. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did an overnight there and then did the rest of the drive, which was like six hours the next yeah. day. And it's three yeah. hours from here in Los Angeles. So it's gotta be a, a, a hoof from, from Salt Lake city, but uh, Vegas is about that, five hours. Yeah. So. And then you drove back after, um, a few days of, of traveling one you know mm -hmm. paso yeah. what's cool about paso they still have a rodeo you know it's still oh, really nice. rural yeah it's still really yeah. rural. and what's also interesting about paso you were a cast which they, they make gorgeous wines yep. they used to make a wine called the flying nymph and then i tried mm -hmm. to sell it and i got in trouble um they have somebody <laughs> one of my customers complained that i would sell something with a name like that so oh. <laughs> Well, it kind of doesn't surprise me that they would name one that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Do you know good. the winemaker and the people there? I have only know the reps that used to handle it down here. I never oh, met. Oh, okay. Them. So okay, well, he's a little. I mean, he's he's a fun guy. He's he's a little crazy. So there's. I mean, it's not only a flying nymph. They had the f bomb and they had yeah. the z spot. So yeah. Uh, you know, that one I got in really big trouble for. But they're good. They're, I bought them. You know, my my premise here is I'm going to buy it if it's good and it represents yeah. what it's supposed to represent. I don't care what the name of the label looks like. Unfortunately, sometimes yeah. people are really stupid. But, you know, the F-bomb one, that one, that one drew some attention <laughs> from my customers. Yeah. So, they're going to, so, it definitely got people talking, right? Yeah, Those right. type of labels and, Yeah. So for what's sure. interesting about Paso for me, and maybe you experienced this, is that you know they're starting to find the terroir. You know they're starting to find varietals that work well where they're at, and they're different than they were, you know, 50, 20 years ago when I started. You know, they used to do a lot of, um, of Italian varietals, and they sort of phased those out. Now they're doing some Rhone varietals, and of course the Bordeaux varietals. And I, th I think that's fascinating for a young you know, district to learn these things about themselves. What did you enjoy there as far as the varietals? and? Well, yeah, I am just to add to that. Um, I found it really interesting, the difference in terroir and how the wines tasted when you tasted one from the east side versus the west mm -hmm. side. Um, because they do, they are quite different. different. And so it was really fun to kind of experience and taste the difference in, between the two areas of Paso. It's, it's funny that it's not, unless you understood that, like you do, it's not necessarily brought out on the bottle, you know, the labeling. I, I'm not sure that it should be, but no. if, you know, if I know, I, I know the understand the district, so I know what, when somebody says they're from Adelaide, where it's from, from the customers wouldn't necessarily know that. Maybe, yeah. maybe your followers wouldn't either. But uh, there is a there is a huge difference. I'm not a huge fan of that. This what's coming out of there for the main stream consumption, which are these really opulent, overripe, you know, just fruit bombs. It doesn't intrigue me, but that's what sells, right? So that's what. We yeah, thought. but it's interesting as t again with time how winemakers are kind of going different directions. Um, I, I preferred uh, probably as you do, some of the wines there that are closer to the coast that aren't kind of those big jammy bombs, right? They're lighter and more delicate. And, um, and I see a lot of winemakers kind of going more in that direction. Mm -hmm. Now those wines are always going to have a place in the industry. There are a lot of people, consumers that love those type of wines. Mm -hmm. um, so they're never gonna go away, but I think um, there's uh, a new appreciation for, for some of the other wines and terroir that's out there. Is that satisfying for you to take people from that 
you know, walking into the market and buying Snoop Dogg's Cali Red, uh, you know, into something more interesting. Let's say for for an example, a cast wine. Is that a satisfying event for you? Oh yeah, um, and that's you know when I started all of this, um, my passion and love for wine started with boutique wineries, small mm -hmm. producers. And that's something I've always focused on. And I do feel like they just are able to put just a little more love into that and focus um, into those wines that you just don't see with mass produced wines. You know, it's hard to define what that aha moment is. Like yeah. what, if, what, if, You've probably seen dozens of them, you know, if you sat down with somebody and they poured something, they go, wait a minute. And I, I, I don't know if it's a physiological thing or a biological thing. It's like, what is it that all of a sudden something clicks, but it's pretty fun. Huh? Oh, it's absolutely fun. Um, and I, I like people to have those aha moments without, I guess, me, um, influencing them too much. I want them to have those mm -hmm. on their own, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, because again, everybody's palate's different and everybody's going to enjoy wine differently. Um, but yeah, those it's fun to have those aha moments and to see other people have those aha moments. It's like, if you have an aha moment from you're sitting there and somebody's talking and you pour them, let's say the cast Vigne or something. And they go, Ooh, wow, this is something else. It's almost like they now turn the corner. How, how important do you think the story is to those moments? In other words, you're, you're at cast, you're going to tell a story about this interesting winemaker and owner of this, the winery. And now all of a sudden the person tastes this Vigne and they go, Whoa. Uh, but how important do you think the story is to, to any of these things that we deal with wine, the expression of wine and the expression of, you know, the value of that glass. I think the stories are everything. And I think back, uh, my first experience, one of my first aha moments was, uh, gosh, how long ago is this? Like 17 years don't ago. Date yourself. No, don't, don't date I yourself. know, right? I know that kind wife, of show. Yeah. Well, my <laughs> first trip, we'll just say my first trip to Napa and, um, at the time, I knew very little about wine. I was starting to drink it. I liked it. I didn't know anything really about it. Um, went to Napa for the first time. Fell in love with everything. The just uh, the rolling hills, the 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 wineries. And back then, you had a lot more winemakers that were pouring the wine for you. And it was those stories. Mm -hmm. it was those stories that they were telling me that was one of those aha moments for me mm -hmm. that where I really fell in love with wine. I remember driving back to the airport and I've told this story a lot, but we were driving back to the airport, my husband and I, and I looked over at him and I said, we are coming back here every single year. <laughs> it just, that was when I knew I loved wine and it was the stories I will say it was the stories that was such a big part of that so now you go to your friends and you leave your husband at home <laughs> <laughs> I, I take him occasionally yeah. <laughs> he, he gets FOMO so yeah right <laughs> it, you know it's one of the things I try to pitch on my business and with customers and we have our tasting coming to this Saturday we do it once a month in the shop and, and it's like I got this for $3 on Groupon isn't a story because the way those wines are manufactured and you were talking about boutique wineries and how, you know, they spend that much more time, but the worst expression of that idea is the Groupon wines, because I know they pay like 85 cents a liter, maybe even less. You know, you're talking about 10 cents worth of wine or 25 cents worth of wine in a bottle that, that they consistently have to try and source throughout the world. And it's all crap. So, yeah. so that's the, that's one side of the expression, right? Like, I got this for three bucks on Groupon. It's like, well, it tastes like it. In fact, yeah. <laughs> I haven't told this story in a while that I was doing it. I had a, a, um, a wine writer in, from drinks, uh, from Punch Drink, a great, fabulous woman. And she was watching me taste uh, through on a Tuesday, which is today. And I go, let's open this wine. It was sent to me by one of my competitors because they had overstock. 
And it was a Beaujolais, which I love. Yeah. It was current vintage. Great. At the time, it was 2019. And it was horrible. Absolutely horrible. I go, this is undrinkable. Now, this is being sold by somebody. But then I turned the label over, and it was Saturday Night Live Beaujolais. Uh -huh. And she looked at me, she goes, what does that mean? I said, this is a wine endorsed by Saturday Night Live. Like, I don't know, you know. And somebody bought it because of that. They thought that's a credential. And then they opened it, and they could not possibly in anybody's imagination say, this is really good with their friends. They could only have said, wow, I just wasted my money. And this is what I'm, this is what we fight, right? This is what we're fighting is this kind of thing. Um, what, what is your go-to? I got off, I got off subject there for a second. What is your, <laughs> what is your go-to restaurant when you go to Napa every time? Oh. The press, mustards. We, uh, we like mustards. We like bricks. We, the press bricks, is, good. we were just at the press on our last trip. Um, what do you really think of the good. changes they made there? They've gone to, uh, they're trying to, I forgot the chef's name now, but he's trying to make this sort of a Michelin star type restaurant as opposed to its old classic sort of nouveau steakhouse. Did you enjoy it? Um, I, I will say I enjoyed the food. I didn't really pay attention too much, uh, or didn't notice, I guess, a big difference in the ambiance. Well, that so, much is the same. He just changed the food. Okay. Okay. Really I, I, I liked the food. Yeah. So. It was good. I yeah. Think it was, it was delicious. Good. So, and their wine yeah. list, of course, is very good. Yeah, it is. Have yep. you been to um, Bodega in Yonville, which is um, Chiarello's uh, Italian place? They're really good. You should go there next time. You know what? Yes. Really Someone good. else referred us to that place. That's in, yeah, north Yonville, of Hillsburg, yeah. right? Yonville. No, no, oh, yeah. sorry. South I'm, of San Helena. Nope, nope, nope. It's above St. Helena, right? Yeah, next time you go. Okay, uh, no, we went to a different one. It's not that one. Of course, the French laundry's there. Not uh, asking if you went, but I will have. I had. A, I did. <laughs> I, I was there during COVID. I don't know. Did you go during COVID to Napa? Um, or just Paso. I'm trying to think if I got there. I didn't. No, not during COVID because COVID happened in March. Oh, actually, I was there in February. The but rooms tripled. Eight. Tripled? They were triple the price. Oh. Maybe even more. Oh I gosh. couldn't believe it. Uh, when I had to go up to just a podcasting, I was, went to my regular hotel, which is the estate in Yonville, and yeah. they want 2100 a night. I didn't stay what? there, just so you know. Oh, my gosh. Can you imagine that? And, oh, by no. the way, you got to call for housekeeping. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thanks. <laughs> what am I but, paying for? <laughs> so that, that same weekend, my wife was in Arizona girls weekend. And so I'm walking by the French laundry and I thought I'm going to take a picture in front of the sign. Like I'm going and send it to yeah. her and friends on a text. So I did that and I'm taking the selfie and this gentleman and his wife were standing there and they go, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm taking a picture to piss off my wife. They go, we want to help. So <laughs> he gets, the guy gets in the picture with this huge grin on his face. And I sent it to the same text string that all her friends are on that are in this trip. And they're like, she's like, who is that? And what are you doing? And, oh, gosh. <laughs> and, and, and her friends like, oh, have fun. They're like <laughs> totally nonchalantly. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I did say on a, on a podcast, I heard you say that you want to work in the wine industry possibly one day. Have you ever had your head examined? Okay. You know, funny thing is now that I've like tried, all, I'm kind of, I do, I have a lot of different things. You know, I've got my mm. wine brokerage in Utah. I do a lot of marketing for brands and content creation. And yeah, I'm not sure there's certain things I would do and would not do in the wine industry. So well, I Rattle off a couple retail, hospitality, um, actually become a wholesale distributor in another state, maybe. Or I, I think I understand that if you, that you can actually open a wholesale operation in Utah, you just have to sell it to the state. Is that accurate? Yeah. So, like, I work with some brands um, through my brokerage, having that license. I can get wines into the state of Utah as special orders. Mm -hmm. Or I can even apply these wines and try to get them into the liquor stores. It's a lot harder to do that, especially with the brands and the wineries that I work with, because they are um, smaller producers. Mm -hmm. 
boutique wines. And although we have a lot of that in the state, the state still has to focus on the big guys. So they have all the, the wines that are mass produced and, and whatnot. So it's a, just a, a tougher process. I, I, I would love someday to move closer to the wine country. Mm. I know I'd have a lot more opportunities if I did that. Um, so, you know, every few months I, I drop the suggestion to my husband and, uh, <laughs> it's just, well, we, you know, we still have kids in school. Um, they're not going to want to move right now. So it's, it's a few years out, but I think eventually that's what's going to We're all happen. trying to get out of California and you want to come. I know, I know, <laughs> I know. Like, I don't know how I would afford to live there, but. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's another problem. Yeah, but but yeah. you know it's a it's a fascinating industry and there's so many facets of it and I and I, I tout sure. myself because I've been doing it for so long and seen so much of it but I I've, I've never made wine I have a license to do it uh, I've blended wines before so there's things in the industry that you know there's there's pretty small sections of it that you could bite off and and absolutely and maybe not experience all the frustrations of what we go through yeah uh, because it's uh, it's it is the margins suck you know as you know. Um, mm -hmm. marketing wine is not that easy. Uh, no. shipping wine is really difficult, but then on the other hand, you know, you get invited to a nice tasting or a place like, you know, Cass winery and Paso Robles, you spend the day there. You kind of go, yeah, I think I can do this. This is all right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, like you said, there's so many different things you could do in the wine industry. My background is sales. I could easily, especially if I didn't live in Utah, I could get a sales job mm -hmm. selling wine. Is that what I want to do? I don't know. I think that I've heard from a lot of people that that's a, it's a grind. Um, I've worked harvest a couple of years. I love working harvest. I, I wouldn't mind um, getting more into making wine, honestly. Mm -hmm. uh, that's but that's a grind too. I mean, yeah, it is hard work. People don't realize how much work goes into a bottle of wine. I wish they did, but they unless you work no, harvest, you will never know. That's what you're doing is you're trying to ex explain that. But it's kind of I wonder if it's like the golfer that's really good at golf and he's the club pro, but then he decides to go on on tour and he realizes that now it's work. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, that's kind of what happens with anything. Um, when I quit my corporate job and took the, the dive into working for myself, um, it's been, it hasn't been easy it's mm -hmm. been hard and it's been up and down and, um, more than they, you expected. They, yeah. And they, you know, they say, Oh, do what you love. You'll never work a day in your life. I think mm -hmm. <laughs> whatever, <laughs> I'm doing what I love, but it's still a lot of work. It's a lot of work. It's well, not you, easy. There's something about it um, that, that is totally different for me here. It was very predictable five, even five years ago, but 10 years and 20 years ago, much more predictable. Uh, today it's very unpredictable. And you're, and you're in that part of the business that's unpredictable. And I think yeah. you mentioned it earlier where, um, uh, no, I think on the podcast that I was listening to, you mentioned, you know, this, I tried to do other things and they don't work. And so it's a known thing in our, in our, this side of the, of the business that you're on, which is what works today is not working tomorrow and work works tomorrow is not going to work the next day. That's, yeah. that becomes hard to, to keep up with. Absolutely. And we all know that social media, especially changes, um, you know, before Instagram, there was Facebook. Now mm -hmm. there's TikTok. Um, and then after TikTok, there's going to be something after that. So I know that uh, the majority of my business, what I'm doing is not sustainable. I need to have other things that I'm doing in the wine industry. Um, something that's a focus for me moving forward into 2023 is doing more writing wine mm -hmm. writing articles. I love writing. So um, I, I'm making that a goal to try to um, do more of those projects. Mm -hmm. um, 
so that, again, I'm not just relying on social media and brand marketing because that's not guaranteed forever. Mm-hmm. It, mm-hmm. it just isn't. No, it's guaranteed to be different and change and possibly change out of your realm of skills. Yeah. And that's just going to happen. Though there's something yeah. encouraging I, I want to tell you. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the book, uh, and I've told the story before to the listeners, but the book, uh, Madame Clicquot or Vuv Clicquot, uh, Widow Clicquot, which is written by a woman named Tila Mazio, now has written two New York Times bestsellers, started as basically what you're saying. Some friends got together and we used to, and in her case, they would always drink Vuv Clicquot champagne together. And then she would sort of come up with an anecdotal comment about the life of Madame Clicquot and she'd bring that to the table. And all of a sudden their friends say, you should write a book. And it's one of the best books I've ever read in the wine business because it taught me so yeah. much about not only champagne and wine, but the you know French history. So uh, you have that on your horizon. If you want to write and you're an influencer, you, there could be a book in your future that you don't even know it yet. I And that could be the case. And I would love that. So it's just, um, it's taking sometimes that first scary step. I, I've done a lot of writing assignments, but nothing like big, huge, or like a book. Mm-hmm. I, I would love to do that. I need to uh, put that fear of failure aside and just, just do it. Of course you have so. kids too. So that's, a- <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> it is. So it makes it mix. difficult, right? So that is the mix. And by the yeah. way, you never stop being a parent, even uh, when your kids are in their thirties and their late twenties, you're still a parent. Just so you got to let, you got to look forward to though. So. Yeah. <laughs> um what's your what's your what's your i'm not gonna say go to a right a lot i don't that's not something but what right now let's i'll turn it around my passion unfortunately is an expensive passion is understanding burgundy france so you have uh, and having gone to paso recently and you've always been in napa many times there's some place that sort of fascinates you uh, from a wine standpoint as far as its culture uh food that um uh, you may pursue a little further in deep, do a, dig a little deeper. Yeah, I honestly want to. Um, well, I've I've started enjoying old world wines a little mm-hmm. bit more than I used to. Um, I visited Bordeaux this past summer, and wow. I want to go back to France. France, yeah. I, I want to go to the Rhone. I want to go to Southern France. I want to go to wow. Champagne. I kind of want to go everywhere, all south. <laughs> I like, I, I want to experience it all, but um, I, I kind of right now am really enjoying old world wines. Wow. Um, and it's funny because we've always, my husband and I have always, uh, well, for the majority, we, we just have drink new world wines mm-hmm. um and it's funny when we share a bottle now that's old world and i'll be like oh my gosh I, i'll kind of like list all this stuff off and what i really like about it and he'll be like yeah I, he's like you're really kind of liking these old world wines a lot more now aren't wow. you because for him his palate is still very much um in line with you know a, a nice big nap a cab yeah um, right and there's definitely some differences when you're having a bordeaux uh red wine versus napa that's a fascinating uh um segment there that you've you've divided basically new world old world because you know wine is to be a place a sense of place and time and mm-hmm that's the that's the what you just said is the definition of that right the old world versus new world uh vintage is being the sense of time but the sense of place clearly and here's here's the way i see it as americans in the napa world and any, even our food you know we don't have any history right yeah. and so we have nothing to protect and in fact our freeways and and places like howard johnson's and these you know motor lodges you know destroyed any regional cuisine in america it's just the known thing and here the french you know they protect their butter and they protect their cheese and they protect their wines yeah. but but they the old world folks look at us and go wow so cool you get to do whatever you want <laughs> you know in america and i look back at the nostalgia of, of europe and say wow you get you know you're you get to protect this history and this value that but so i think that's what your experience is like wow i get to really sense something different 
the and, more and, to the and everything is so fresh there you yeah. know it's not processed food at least not as much as we have here i mean just everything tasted like they're they're their bread, yeah. their croissant, Hello. their like, oh my gosh, everything. It makes you think. Can you imagine? Can you imagine a, a French person who you know from a village who goes down to the local boulanger boulangerie and gets a, a, a you know a baguette and takes it home, ends up a star or a croissant, and he goes to Starbucks and gets one of those things. Yeah. You, you come to America, you must go. This is disgusting. <laughs> I know. I know. This stuff, right? <laughs> yeah, so, I love you, the culture of Europe. It's yeah, just so it's really different. fascinating. Um, my thing is Burgundy. You know, it's very expensive mm. to, to learn about Burgundy. And yeah. though I did a little rant the other day in the market, a little selfie video, because the entry level wines, and I don't know, I, I'd like to hear if, if you are familiar with the wines they're having at the at the DABC or DBAS uh, stores, but the entry level versions of those old world wines kind of suck you know oh, yeah you put a cheap bordeaux out there or an inexpensive one or inexpensive burgundy then they're not going to represent mm -hmm. you know the value of what's out there is that I know. Uh, what do they have at the stores in utah to experience are you bringing them in or do you have access to them or what what do you do no uh, i mean i've no. tasted them <laughs> and the burgundy wines here in our i'll tell you right now i haven't um experienced one that's good yeah that's too but bad. they well, and the selection is just, you don't have as many, right. um, you know, you may have a handful mm. of Burgundy wines right from Burgundy. Yeah. That's sad. I know. You know, we yeah. go to New York and it's like, I don't, I wrote, it's an unbelievable, this, the amount of wine I don't recognize in New York because it's so close to Europe. Yeah. You know, they just get much more than we do. And here, Utah probably gets even less, you know, than the West Coast does just because of the criteria, you know, the way they buy wines. That's too bad. When you go to the well, restaurant in Utah. Oh, well, the restaurants, there's some really good wine lists. On, uh, uh huh. Yeah. Um, there's probably a better Burgundy on some of the restaurant wine lists than in the liquor stores, which is interesting because I, I wonder who... Is well, they probably do it cheaper, that right? or, yeah yeah it is but you but, could import it for a restaurant you could say listen i'll get you some really good burgundies or bordeaux whatever yeah and then you go through the emaciations for the with the government to get it into that store yeah yeah i could hmm. do that i just don't have the time yeah <laughs> i have brands that i work with to get special orders into the state that want me to try to get in to restaurants that is it's boots on the ground, right? I've got to get out there and uh, it's, it's a lot of work and I'm just staying so busy with other yeah. things. I haven't done that yet. So we'll see sometimes if that's life, in my future. Sometimes life gets in the way, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is, we're, we're already on an hour almost, which has been fascinating to have you on the show yeah. and uh, would love this to do it again. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, I'm not sure. I don't think I'm sure I have any plans to get to Salt Lake uh, soon, but if I did, uh, would love to have a glass with you and oh, absolutely. Go storm yeah. the ABC and find out what the hell their problem is. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I think sometimes I've they've oh, they've been difficult to work with, and I'm like, maybe I'm just too like blunt and like. No, come on, you guys, your process can't be this hard, but yeah, maybe I pissed them off. I don't know, but no, it's, it's you it's know, not easy. It's a, it's, I've done it over my career selling software to, to governments, both state, local, and federal. Uh, all of it, you know, Utah's no different than any other government, it, and it happens to be in the liquor business. So, uh, it's interesting to, I had this conversation with somebody, and I don't know if it was at the store, maybe it was with the clerk at the store. Because the church, the Mormon church is there, it's socially Mormon, right? Generally, that's what people look at as Utah. But yeah. the government is not. The government has Mormon influences from the citizenry, but the government knows that it's a government and it has to govern the community. And so they also realize 
that alcohol is an important part of you know the consumption of the human being and and, and yeah. there's tourism and there's skiing in Utah and there's hiking and there's boating mm -hmm. and so they have to have it accessible they, so it's, they that's do. the balance that they that they work with but as far as you know the layers of red tape those exist they're never going to change they're always going to be that way whether it's Utah the city of Los Angeles or you know state of Colorado it's not that's not going to change so don't blame yeah. yourself yeah well and part of the problem though is that so many of these folks that are in the government and they're running the state they're they're mormon they are lds so they believe what they believe which mm -hmm. you know drinking is drinking alcohol is bad so um i don't see a lot of these laws changing until we get a little more diversity with the folks that are in politics here, because right now 80% of them are LDS. The politics, the uh, elected officials. Yes. Right. Yeah. So that's, that's hard. That, yeah, that's an interesting um, irony there between the folks that push the pencils and, and execute the laws versus the people that are making the laws. Yeah. That's interesting. So. I, but I, I will say I was very impressed with with that store. I was impressed with the number of SKUs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Complete departure from you know what my vision was of those days, of the earlier days anyway. And so maybe on the horizon there's other changes. Well, did you find a good burgundy? Did you look for one while you no, were? No, I didn't. That I was just sort of walking around. I had to, you know, sort of in a okay. rush. I wanted to make sure it wasn't late yeah. for my flight because it's so important to get home. Uh, but I was like, you know, the, the impulse stuff and some of the liquor too was very high end. Um, yeah, yeah. Tequilas We've and things. Yeah. And, and then I went to, I also on the way back, I happened to notice a liquor store and that was more like a liquor store, right? The skews were much less and the wine was like, you know, barefoot sellers, stuff like that. Uh, and the liquor was the regular liquor. So I saw both sides of this. I saw the premium wine shop and I saw the sort of corner liquor store. So but yeah, just, they're both state artists. run though. They're both yeah, state run. They're state run, right? Yeah, but you, I know exactly which store you went into, and it is, it probably has some of the best wines in the state because not all stores have all this exact same wines. Right. Some wines are only in certain stores, and you went into the good one. <laughs> well, I got lucky. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Well, it's been a pleasure, Brooke, so much. I look, I wish you success. We're going to, what we'll do is we're going to send you the credentials when this publishes and you'll be able to uh, repost and do what you want with it. There'll also be some uh, graphic work that we'll send along if you want to use it, but a fascinating conversation and I hope we can do it again. I do too. Thanks, Paul. This has been fun. Cheers.